If I asked you who Hollywood's very first romantic screen couple on and off screen were, and you answered Beverly Bain and Francis X. Bushman, then you're a nerd. But a correct nerd. They did a ton of silent films together, even starring in Romeo and Juliet in 1915 or 16. He was actually one of the very first movie stars, but you never hear his name anymore, and sadly, you're not going to get to see their house. 2020 Grace Avenue doesn't exist anymore, but apparently it was just the stuff of legend, a magnificent property, and Bushman apparently had Great Danes everywhere he went, even in his car. He was always surrounded by Great Danes. My pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Francis X. Bushman, who played Masala in the original film version of Ben-Hur. Mr. Bushman was just telling me that he, too, found some difficulties with the chariot race. I should say wrecks every day and horses killed. The house burnt down in the 60s, and the lot stayed vacant for a while until these houses were built on what is now Kendra Court. And I'm actually not sure what the story is. It's like a little community or something? I don't know. But I do know that after the whole freeway debacle, the preservation of Whitley Heights got kicked into overdrive. Committees were formed, rules were made, and the neighborhood actually became one of LA's first to become a historic preservation overlay zone. Basically, that just means you can't destroy anything, and if you're going to build or remodel, you have to follow a complete set of guidelines, like everything has to fall within the Mediterranean style, and they all have to have tile rooftops. But the best part, and I have goosebumps telling you this, is that they're not allowed to touch these palm trees because Francis X. Bushman planted them. What? Eleanor Boardman, a silent film star who was married to one of the biggest directors, King Vidor, also lived here. She had a couple marriages. In fact, she was set to have a double wedding with John Gilbert and Greta Garbo, but Garbo pulled out, got cold feet, and never got married. One of Mary Pickford's biggest rivals, Blanche Sweet, a huge star who worked with Cecil B. DeMille and D.W. Griffith, lived here at 2020. Talkies ruined her career and she spent the rest of her life working at various L.A. department stores. People from the regular theater looked down upon you for making motion pictures. They thought the stage was superior to films and uh, it was for a while, let's face it, it was. A movie star with some of the biggest box office records of all time lived here, Tyrone Power, huge, huge matinee idol star of the 30s and 40s, until actually 1942 when he enlisted in the Marines. He was married a couple times. Lana Turner claims in her biography that they had an affair and that she opted not to keep their love child. He served in the military and then came back to films and had a heart attack on the set of one of them when he was 44. He was buried with full-on military honors, and Laurence Olivier actually recited a poem at his funeral. He too is at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, like many, many, many people on this tour. Two more men lived here at various times. Alan Dwan, a film director, he directed Gloria Swanson a handful of times, and then Burton Holmes, he coined the phrase travelogue, becoming the first man to combine traveling with filmmaking. The Van Patten family, their television royalty, and Joyce, sister of Dick, lived here with her husband Martin Balsam, and they had a daughter named Talia, who was once married to George Clooney, and is now married to John Slattery. She actually auditioned when she was a child for a small role in Gone with the Wind. She originated a role in As the World Turns, and eventually became known for just years and years of really good television work. <laughs> this cracks me up. She got cast opposite her ex-husband Martin in the film St. Elmo's Fire, playing Mayor Winningham's very married parents. <laughs> her nephew Vince Van Patten is, of course, married to Eileen Davidson, and honestly, Joyce is in her late 80s, almost 90, and she could very well still live here. I have no idea.
Another actress who had been acting for a long time but whose career didn't take off until she was middle-aged was Mary Jackson. Now, she was in a show that creeped me out as a kid, The Waltons. I still can't look at it today. But I loved her in Airport and Coming Home and Big Top Pee Wee. She actually originated the role of Alice Horton on Days of Our Lives, the soap that I watched, but just for the pilot, she uh, never ended up playing the part. She did a bunch of fun shows like The Mary Tyler Moore Show, My Three Sons, The Twilight Zone. She was a longtime resident of Whitley Heights and died in 2005, and these steps are actually called the Mary Jackson Steps. What is the flying saucer? What do people see and sometimes photograph? What's behind the daily reports of aerial phenomena in the nation's press? Undismayed by the attacks of True Magazine, Frank Scully, author of a book, Behind the Flying Saucers, offers his views. This is just silly. In the 1940s, UFOs became a huge thing. They called them flying saucers. And a writer for Variety named Frank Scully actually wrote a book in 1950 called Behind the Flying Saucers. In it, Frank claimed he had been working with a NASA scientist who was providing him with all the information about these flying saucers, but basically in the 50s, the scientist admitted that he had pulled the wool over poor Frank's eyes and that he had been conned. We did it! We completed the entire upper part of Whitley Heights. All right, we're heading back towards the Norma Shear house. Next to it is a set of stairs. In fact, they're one of the only sets of stairs in LA that have been given an actual LA proper street address. These steps weren't just put into exercise on though, they were a necessity. Um, there were very few cars when this area was developed. All right, we're back down on Milner Road. We've been up there, it's where Lenore Coffee and Marie Dressler and Watsonia Terrace is. At the end of Milner is Las Palmas Avenue, a street composed of newer apartment complexes juxtaposed with some of the oldest houses built in the Whitley Heights neighborhood. In the first house on the corner lived a young silent film star named Paul Kelly. Paul was dating a married actress named Dorothy McKay and got in a fist fight with her husband. The husband died as a result and Paul ended up doing time at San Quentin. The trial was an absolute sensation. Dorothy actually did some time too for lying on the stand about the affair. And get this, when Paul gets out of jail, totally resumes his career, does films, even Broadway, and wins a Tony.
I had never heard of this classically trained singer, John Charles Thomas, who lived here, but I found a clip when he was on Groucho Marx's show, and this high school girl sang a pop song, and John trashed the genre, and this woman in the audience had to get up and defend rock and roll. Well, what'd you think of it, John? <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't know, but I, I, I still think I prefer music. Classical. I think that I like the old melodies of uh, Beethoven and Brahms and Schubert. It's okay, but uh, you can't jitterbug to Mozart. Uh, John, you better run for your life. The audience is striking back. <laughs> what is your reason for sticking up for rock and roll? You're not a teenager. That doesn't make any difference whether I'm a teenager or not, Groucho. I think the world is changing. It has changed. You mean and all you're... this malarkey and jazz that they are putting out about bop, unspeakable jazz, unspeakable rock and roll, lewd, vulgar, what's it going to do to reckon the teenagers? That's absolutely malarkey. It is not so, because we have got to have it. Well, do you buy rock and roll records? Are you speaking to me? Yes. I most certainly do. Whose records do you buy? Uh... Elvis Presley. <laughs> Las Palmas curves around and turns into Bonaire Place. We've actually peeked down Bonaire when we were at Army Archer's house, but we'll walk up there and I'll show you a really cool view of Hollywood. Again, Army Archer's old house up that way, but I want to show you a really cool view of Hollywood, looking at the Hollywood and Highland area, Chinese theater, the Dolby theater, where the Oscars are, all the fun stuff. Okay, so Milner Road spills out into Highland Avenue, which serves as the western perimeter of Whitley Heights, right below the Hollywood Bowl where Highland merges with the 101 freeway. So if you've ever made a dime in the film industry, then you owe this barn a little nod of respect. It now sits near a picnic area in the Hollywood Bowl parking lot, but believe it or not, it was once used as the very first film studio. It was built as a barn on a property on Vine Street, kind of near where the Capitol Records building sits. And in 1914, Cecil B. DeMille filmed the very first full length feature film here. It only took a couple thousand dollars to get the movie made, but when it came out, it grossed a couple hundred thousand dollars. So boom, there you have it. Entire industry was born. Cecil was working with Jesse Lasky, which is eventually how Paramount Pictures was formed. And in 1927, to save the barn from demolition, the men had it moved to the current Paramount location at Melrose and Gower, where it sat for over 50 years. From 1929 to 79, it was the Studio Gym, and it can also be seen in the background of Bonanza a lot, but in the 80s, some Paramount executive in a suit wanted it gone, so it moved across town. Oh my god, I totally made that up about the executives. It could have been generously donated. I have no idea. It just seems like such an 80s executive thing to do. Michael Keaton and Terry Garr have to save the barn from John Lithgow. It's been the Hollywood Heritage Museum since 1985, has some really cool props and artifacts from early Hollywood inside, you should check it out. But it sits in this parking lot because another Hollywood museum was supposed to, but I'm not gonna tell you about that one till the next neighborhood tour. Also in that tour, I will talk about the little French village that existed right where I'm standing, across from the Hollywood Bowl, right here on Highland Avenue. All right, kids, if you've been paying attention in class, you can probably guess that we're heading towards the underpass of the 101, which split Whitley Heights in two. So I'm gonna show you what's left of the neighborhood on the east side of the 101.
on Cahuenga Boulevard, which you saw at the very beginning of this tour, and just off of it is Iris Circle, a tiny little loop, but packed with a lot of fun Hollywood history. This house was built in 1923 for a surgeon, but has a pretty current resume. Busy Phillips had it at one point, and Rose McGowan owned it, sold it to Rachel Bilson, and then Jennifer Goodwin lived here for close to a decade. Please just don't ever tell me if you don't know who Carol Lombard is or if you've never seen one of her movies. I mean, there's a reason that the AFI named her number 23 out of the 100 greatest screen stars of all time. Oh, she's gorgeous, hilarious, witty, clever, all of it. Um, check out my man Godfrey. She was born, she was born. It came out in 1936 and co-stars her husband, William Powell, with whom she lived in this house. <laughs> when it's someone I love, I just get so excited to tell you everything I know about them. Um, all right, she was born in 1908 in Indiana and her parents divorced. She was raised by her single mom who decided to move the family out to LA. You might remember me mentioning a film director named Alan Dwan. Well, he discovered Carol when she was 12 years old playing baseball in a neighborhood with a bunch of boys completely kicking their asses and gave her a small part in one of his films. Then our old buddy Max Sennett hired Carol to be one of his bathing beauties, doing a bunch of comedies for him, and then eventually landing herself a contract at Paramount Pictures. See, it all comes back to that barn. As her career was rising, she married William Powell, who was then Paramount's top leading man, and they moved into this house together where they lived throughout the duration of their marriage, which only lasted from 1931 to 1933. They amicably divorced, and actually, William remained really good friends with Carol throughout the rest of her life, even when Clark Gable took a break filming Gone with the Wind to marry her in 1939. During World War II in 1942, Carol, her mother, and Clark Gable's publicist all flew to Indiana to attend a rally to raise money for war bonds. On January 16th, they were leaving Indiana and deciding whether or not to go by train or plane back to California. Carol's mother and the publicist had a fear of flying, but Carol wanted to get home quickly, so they decided to toss a coin. Carol won the coin toss, so they boarded a plane and flew to Las Vegas, where the plane stopped and refueled, and shortly after takeoff, it crashed into a mountain, killing everyone on board, including 15 soldiers. It was truly one of the most shocking tragedies in Hollywood history, really. Uh, but I'll leave you with two fun facts. One, one of her absolute best friends was Lucille Ball. And two, she apparently had the mouth of a truck driver. You know, not only does it make me have something to think of, something to think of. I got that far. Holy Jesus Christ. Uh oh, sit down and talk to me. I like to talk in the morning when your head is clear, particularly when you've been someplace. Some Christ knows when, some other night. Christ in the middle of it. Hello, Godfrey. Hey, you can put the golf in the nuts on the fish. Fish. Come on, quick. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't like that shit. First part of the squad. Yes, I know it was, but I stunk up the... I say that.
All right, get ready for the name of the actress who lived in this house. Helen Twelve Trees. How great. And it's real. She was born in Brooklyn, attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, where she met fellow actor and future husband, Clark Twelve Trees. One night during a Manhattan dinner party, Clark decides to jump out of a window, but an awning saves his life and knocks him into a taxi cab. He's knocked unconscious and hospitalized, and the police, tabloids, everyone thinks that Helen pushed him. He was an alcoholic and he beat her severely, but when he woke up, he confessed that he was trying to commit suicide. She ended up divorcing him in 1931, and a few years later, he died in a street brawl. Just an absolute mess. Helen remarried and spent the entire 30s decade as a Hollywood movie star, acting opposite John Barrymore and Spencer Tracy, and she even had top billing opposite John Wayne and Clark Gable. Her last movie was called Unmarried, and it co-starred a young Donald O'Connor who would grow up to be a Whitley Heights resident himself, living in the Pike House, which we saw earlier on this tour. The film industry was changing in the 40s, and her career died down. She returned to theater, and in 1958, at age 49, she killed herself by overdosing on barbiturates. It's pretty surreal to realize that somebody can make 32 films with huge movie stars and still have their entire career completely forgotten. And you know what? Today's stars are no different. You'll see. I don't have the resources to back up this next house the way I do all the other homes on this tour, but I read in a real estate blog that Marie Dressler loved Whitley Heights so much that she bought a second home here. It's a sign, I have to go through. What if it's like Narnia and I just like step through and become this matinee idol from 1920s? Oh, please. Oh my God, yes. Ugh, I wish. I can't believe this. I always see it when I drive, but I've never gotten to just like stop and look at the remnants of Valentino and Maybelline's old house.
So Harold Lloyd apparently lived in this house, but in another part of Whitley Heights, and when the freeway came through, the house was moved and put here to keep it from being destroyed. Okay, you've obviously heard of America's sweetheart, Mary Pickford, but have you heard about her troublesome, scandalous, wild, party girl sister, Lottie Pickford? Precious and fragile things Need special handling My God, what have we done to She was born Charlotte Smith in 1893 in Canada, just a couple years after her older sister Gladys and a couple years before her younger brother Jack. In the early 1900s, they made their way to New York where all three of them actually starred in tons and tons of short films before Gladys decided she wanted to head west and try her luck in Hollywood. Gladys decided to change her name to Mary Pickford, so Lottie and Jack followed suit, changed their last name, and the two of them really had a strong bond their entire lives that never included Mary. They found her uptight and rude. The more I read about Mary Pickford, the more insufferable she becomes. She told Lottie that she wasn't pretty enough to be in film, and then later in life, Lottie wanted her own children's radio show, but Mary, who was also on the radio, said only one person in the family can have a show. But Lottie ended up making about eight movies. Jack did about 40, and Mary, of course, did a gazillion, won an Oscar, became America's sweetheart, and was so mad when Lottie played a prostitute in 1914's The House of Bondage. Things get damaged, things get broken. I thought we'd manage, but words left us broken. Left us so Britain, there was so little left. The one thing that Lottie loved more than filmmaking was partying, and I, I mean, the stories of her parties are legendary, and most of them happened while she lived in this house. Lottie's housekeeper recalled that all she saw was booze, drugs, and naked people, and that whenever Mary would show up, she would warn Lottie so that all her friends could get dressed and hide all the drugs and booze. She was constantly getting in trouble. The police were called here all the time. And there was once even a story that she was out late at night and got abducted. I mean, she really just made headlines for all the wrong reasons. Even though she was a partier, people loved her, said she was very sweet and down to earth. She just led a really wild life. And it got worse when Jack died in 1933 at the age of 36 from alcoholism. It devastated Lottie. I mean, they were so close, but now, you know, she was stuck with Mary and continued to drink. And she too had a alcohol problem that killed her in 1936 at the age of 43. Mary lived till 87, dying in 1979. She of course lived at the famous mansion Pick Fair. And I had Pia Zadora on my show who famously moved in afterwards and became notorious for destroying it. It's a huge house. No, it's a goddamn hotel. <laughs> it's like it's like the Four Seasons with its own staff. It was. It was. Now you moved into it. It wasn't really me. It just was overwhelming. The whole Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd part of Whitley Heights confuses me. I always read conflicting stuff. I think Charlie Chaplin lived here, but not this house. I think it was just the address. But this all changed when the freeway came.
have one more little. Oh! Oh! <laughs> cool show, bro. Um, all right, we have one more little nook to cover, just two more houses. A, another completely forgotten actress. Gert you know what? Her name is forgotten too, and that is not such a bad thing. Gertrude. Ugh. God. Right up there with Ida. <sighs> Gertrude Astor, no relation to Mary Astor or even Roxy Astor, was born in Lima, Ohio, and came out to Hollywood, made silent films with Gloria Swanson, Laurel and Hardy, Our Gang, bunch of fun stuff. No real scandals or stories, just lived on a little cul-de-sac with a cute yellow door. Worked from the teens to the early 60s and died on her 90th birthday in 1977 at, you guessed it, the motion picture country home in Woodland Hills. If you saw The Trial of the Chicago 7, then you're familiar with Eddie Redmayne's portrayal of Tom Hayden, but did you know that Tom was married to Jane Fonda from 1973 to 1990 and at one point lived with her in this house? I mean, there just aren't that many people in Hollywood as outspoken or active as Jane Fonda, and she certainly met her match with Tom, who saw her give an anti-war speech at a Vietnam protest in 1972. They fell in love and got married the following year. We'd like you to see Jane's answer to a question put to her by the Good Day Show several months ago. Wasn't that long ago? When asked what was the greatest award you've ever had, she answered this way. Oh, God, I think uh, when Tom wanted to marry me. <laughs> They had a son named Troy Garrity, who grew up to have the great Fonda acting genes, and gave him Jane's mom's maiden name, Garrity, because they knew how controversial the names Hayden and Fonda were. So bummed I missed this era of Jane Fonda. I grew up when she was married to Ted Turner and I don't really know anything about him, but he always creeped me out and she wasn't herself around him. And I don't know, this era just really fascinates me and Tom seemed like such a cool guy. They were married for 17 years and divorced so amicably that they continued to work together trying to change the world. And when Tom died in 2016, Jane had nothing but praise for him and talked about how much she missed him. It's pretty plain and simple We gave it all we could It's time I wave goodbye from the window Let's end this like we shouldn't say we're good We're not meant to be like sleeping and cocaine So let's at least agree to go our separate ways Y'all gonna judge Look, Jane Fonda and I have met, and I think that's just something you need to know. And it will absolutely never come from her, so it's up to me to tell you.
They say don't meet your idols, but I did, and she was just fantastic. Jane's house spills out onto Grace Avenue, where I said we would end the tour. And here's a really fun California apartment. And up there is the very top of Whitley Avenue. Well, we did it. Congratulations, you now have a master's degree in Whitley Heights. I really wanna hear what you thought of the tour. Not the bad stuff, just the good stuff. Uh, favorite streets, favorite people, favorite homes, favorite stories, tell me. I'm gonna be moving on to different neighborhoods, filming locations, stories, etc. But if you love Whitley Heights as much as I do, you need to follow Kuanga Past and Before the 101, two super fun accounts, completely immersed in this neighborhood. They are fantastic. But in the meantime, thank you so much for watching this. And I don't really have a sign off line, so just be a fun person. Pick -tock, pick -tock, uh.